thank you all for joining us. Um, some of you look to be first timers here with us um, doing our virtual slow less, so welcome. Um, we have a very special guest today, Yvonne Savio, and we're so excited to welcome her. First, I'm going to give a little bit of background about SLOLA, who we are, what we do. Um, my name is Gina, and I've been with SLOLA for a little over a year. Um, SLOLA is a nonprofit uh, local organization based in Los Angeles. Uh, we have one other branch in Venice, but our east side branch is based in Altadena. And before COVID, we met monthly at the Altadena Library, and we love them. Thank you. Um, while we do have lead organizers like Sue, Danielle, Deborah, and myself, um, and a head coordinator, Jessica Yarger, um, we are a collective. And this means we're going um, to be growing with a model that depends on the participation of the community. Um, the goals of SLOLA are to grow acclimated seeds to our specific bioregion. Um, can you guys hear all this beeping on my end? No, okay, good. Um, so I have a message here. Uh, uh, Danielle says, um, people that are coming in would be recorded if your video is on. So if you don't wanna be recorded, please turn off your video. Um, so the whole impetus of SOLA is that we're growing um, seeds that are acclimated to this microclimate. Um, our climate here on the east side is very specific. As we all know, we have very long summers, it's very dry. Um, so if, if we can grow seeds in this area for seven seasons, that's considered to be climatized to our bioregion. The other goal of SLOLA is to build community of gardeners and people interested in food security, habitat restoration, and wildlife, as well as a network of knowledge and wisdom that we can cultivate communally um, and build resiliency as humans, um, the legacy of the seeds we're growing, and the wildlife we cohabitate with. So how SLOLA works is our meetings are always open for all to attend, and they are free. We have speakers each month who will share on various topics that we find relevant to the mission. And um, we also factor in what you guys wanna learn. To be a member, you must live in LA. So the membership comes, um, it's a $10 lifetime donation, and that gives you access to checking out seeds. And we use the term checking out because the intention is that you'll actually bring these seeds back um, from your own garden after you've saved them. Uh, we have a strict policy that all of the seeds that we collect and give are open pollinated, organic, and non-GMO. Um, for varieties that commonly hybridize with others, um, such as spinach, lettuce, corn, beets, chard, brassicas, all of that, um, you'll want to isolate your plant seeds in order to save a true seed for the library here. Please definitely share with uh, your gardener friends and family members um who are growing around you we want this to be a very diverse and robust community so thank you all very much for joining us and i will pass it off to sue who's going to introduce yvonne okay there we go Hi, everybody. A uh, couple of quick things. I want to mention again that we are recording. If you don't want to be on camera, please turn off your video. Also, we will be saving questions uh, for specific points in the presentation. So if you have a question that you think of as we go, please put it in the chat so that we can circle back around to it. Um, third, how many of you here are here for the first time? And how many of you are members? If you could just throw something into the chat and give us a feel, that would be awesome. Now, I would like to introduce Yvonne Savio. Yvonne, who's a native of Pasadena, started the University of California Cooperative Exten Extension Master Gardeners Program like two and a half decades ago. And over those years that she was running it, she trained personally over 1,100 master gardeners. 
to have rippled out through the greater LA area and changed basically the shape of how people grow food at home. She retired in 2015, but she still loves educating gardeners on growing food and flowers in Southern California and beyond. So welcome, Yvonne. Thanks a lot, Sue and Gina and Slola in general. Um, <clears throat> You know, I was uh, David King, who started the original Slola at Venice High School Learning Garden, uh, was one of our honorary master gardeners. Um, he was the only the second one after my husband um, who received that honor just because they had contributed so much to the program. Certainly, my husband, in terms of um, really enabling me to play as much as I possibly could, both when we were up in Davis for the Yolo County Master Gardeners, which I did start with several of her gardeners who kept showing up at our local nursery. So we developed our own class up there. And then when I moved back down here to uh, Los Angeles County and moved into my, my childhood home where I am now, uh, and my own garden again, and all my own weeds, um, I was able to uh, continue and expand the Master Gardener program here in Los Angeles County. And that's the one that since 1994 up until 2015, um, all the gardeners that joined our program uh, because they wanted to help other folks grow more food, um, we ended up developing quite a tremendous extensive program. So um, since that time, the uh, uh, advisor, horticulture advisor and the program head have continued doing wonderful things with the program. So um, when I retired, um, I did start my own website, which is gardeninginla.net, uh, specifically to carry through with a lot of the uh, positive kinds of communication modes that we had developed in the Master Gardener program for the general public. And that includes um, a listing of monthly tips, discussion, about why that particular month is the best time to do that particular activity. And you'll notice, of course, as you found out in your gardens, that it may go over a two, three, four month time period that you can do that same activity. So monthly tips, um, I have a section on news items that I find and that people send to me, online articles, um, that are just fascinating, I think, for gardeners. Um, we have an events section uh, where uh, members of the public can uh, fill out the online form of what events they know, um, garden clubs, and right now, of course, it's mostly online webinars like this one. There is a section on web links, um, and that is split into the University of California websites and then non-university websites that are science-based and real information. And on that page as well is a list of several of the Zoom meetings like this one that have been recorded and I've posted online so that you can um, go through some of those at your desire. Um, I do make uh, presentations and consultations with individual gardens, so you can check that part out on my website as well. But please do wander through that. And if you'd like to get announcements on uh, when I uh, post my, um, every, about every two weeks, another blog on literally and specifically what is happening in my garden in Pasadena, um, that can be really helpful because it gives you, because you folks are very local, um, a sense of, oh, it's happening in her garden too, and she figured out what's going on, or else why isn't mine working the way she says hers is, 
or certainly like with all these fires and the tremendous heat we have, I have specific instructions about what to do and what not to do um, as a result of either the coming heat or the heat we just had and those kinds of specific uh, problems and opportunities that we have in our gardens. So at this particular time of the year, of course, it's um, restarting our, or not restarting, actually starting our fall and winter gardens that we can be planting items now um, in order to be able to eating, be eating those items for several months just by virtue of harvesting just the outer leaves of the leafy items like lettuce, uh, bok choy, um, and a lot of those kinds of vegetables. So um, also flowers, uh, there's a tremendous number that can be planted now so that you can and be enjoying them for months and months and months and even years because a lot of them are um, biennials and perennial and bulbs too. So let's get started on those. Um, I do hope that you have been able to perhaps print out the handout that was provided with the confirmation because that has the list of all of the um, um, I'll put it up briefly here. I don't, so that you might recognize it. Okay, here's the list of all the different plants. We'll go through the veggies first, and then that's one column, and then we have two columns of flowers. So let me, whoops. Okay, so fall and winter planting in Southern California. Now you'll notice there's a lot of nasturtiums here, uh, roses, um, bachelor buttons, hollyhocks, uh, this was taken in the late spring, but it's because all, many of these plants you can be planting now in order to have the plants develop over the fall and winter and look like this next spring, which is why it's fall and winter planting. Okay, so the veggies here. We have two pictures of artichokes. And um, I wanted you to see this one, if you've never grown artichokes before, to recognize that there are two kinds of leaves here. Here's the one that has no cut edges on it. It's just one big, nice leaf. And then these leaves are the ones that are more recognizable as artichoke leaves. And that is because this is called a true leaf. And uh, many times when you start by seed, you'll find that you will have some of the cotyledon um, leaves coming up first, and then maybe the third or fourth or fifth batch of leaves that comes up is going to be a true leaf. And that's when you know that the plant is generally large enough in order to go ahead and actually transplant it. Now the second, um, picture here. This is a container that is probably, oh, about 25 inches across and deep. And I'm showing you this because it does have this one artichoke plant in it, which is going to be quite a, um, well, artichokes can last up to 15 years in the garden if you provide the, the nutrition and the water and all that kind of good stuff but it will do fine in a container actually producing its artichoke here, um, as long as you have a very large container. Um, and as I say, this is about 25 inches across and deep. It's more important to have the deep container than a wide container. 
because thus the gravity will pull down the water and the roots will be able to have that much um, more uh, nice growing area down lower because it has the water and it's cooler. Um, and so especially during growing during the summer, it will be a much more successful planting that you have. Now, you always have to figure out what kind of a root system plants, your main plant is in a container because then that will determine whether or not you can grow other things around there as well, or if it's going to compete with the main plant. So in this case, because the container is so wide and so deep, the extensive root system of the artichoke it can support these shallow additional plants like the basil, parsley, oregano, that kind of thing around there. Because the roots of the artichoke will be down at the bottom half of the container, the roots of the smaller uh, foliage plants will be in the top six, eight inches of the container. So it's not going to be competing um, their root systems will not be competing. However, you do have to make a point of watering sufficiently to support all of those plants. Um, asparagus, you do want to let the um, stems grow up tall and put out their ferns because that is going to be growing all summer long, but then that is going to be dying back um, later this fall, and all that energy is going to be absorbed back down into the roots, which then is going to um, expand the plant next time around and give you much more food each year. And remember that you really, once you've planted um, either the seed or preferably a two year old root, um, you won't want to harvest more than literally one or two of the shoots as they come up until you get a good batch of them because otherwise you're going to be cutting away the energy that the plant would have used to increase its size. Beets of course for the last batch of years have come up with all sorts of colors and especially this Cheogia here which is like a bullet um, uh, sign, target sign. Um, and so it certainly makes, like with all the colors in a tomato garden varieties, um, there's a lot of different colors in the beets. Um, but I grew up on the, the Detroit dart regs, so for me that's the correct flavor of beets. But remember about all the greenery too. Um, even the ones that I let grow uh, to become the globes that I pick, I always use certainly the interior leaves when I harvest the globe. The outer ones sometimes have gotten so mature that they're pretty ratty looking, but the internal um, leaves, the little ones, are very tender. Um, and those are great in salads, raw and cooked. Broccoli. Uh, this one is demonstrating that it's put out quite a selection of smaller heads. If you do get the variety that puts out a huge head, um, you'll want to cut that as soon as possible when it's developed because then the secondary and tertiary growth will be forced to come out of each one of the nodes all the way along through the entire broccoli plant and those little heads will be tiny, literally bite-sized. So I really prefer to harvest a lot of bite-sized ones rather than one huge head at the beginning of the season. Cabbage, different kinds here, the Savoy, which are the crinkly kind and the smooth kind. Um, you'll find that a lot of them are different. Uh, there's one, um, I don't recall the name now, but it has quite a pointed head to it. 
So it's really fun to see just in terms of textures and shapes and colors, all the kinds of um, cabbage that you can grow. Here is a cabbage that has grown so far that it literally is going to flower from the center. It has split itself apart and it's going to be flowering up top here. Now, all the way along, you know that one of the great advantages of gardening on your own is that you can decide when to harvest something. So whereas this would not be a commercially viable stage of this cabbage, you may find just munch your way through. The, certainly this um, sprouting area will be very tender. Uh, these older ones might be pretty heavy duty by that time and you wouldn't like to harvest them. But you never know, especially when it's grown all through the cool season, it will remain more tender longer than anything that is grown during the hot season. Carrots, of course, come in many shapes and sizes. These are the little Romeo, which are only an inch in size, and they're very round, and they really sit pretty much on the top of the soil. So these are a wonderful variety to choose if you have very heavy clay soil because carrots really aren't all that strong in terms of pushing their uh, way down through heavy soil. So a, a much more composty uh, containing soil is going to be um, fostering a longer, thinner carrot. The chantonets are the ones that are the really long ones. They can get, you know, 9, 12 inches, and then remember that little tiny little hair-like root is probably going to be double the size of what ultimately is the size of the carrot part that we eat. So Danvers Half Long is the type that I use in my garden, and that's um, started out as decomposed granite because we're on a hillside with literally 60 years of manure and compost in it. So it's a very nice friable soil, but I still prefer the Danvers Half Long because I will get a very nicely developed carrot uh, rather than my struggling to try to get the really long Chantonese. And of course, all the colors that there are now is just fascinating. But do, um, uh, remember that it, you're going to have different flavors and the carrots especially will taste very turpentiney if they're grown slowly. I'm Well, slowly in terms of it's too hot weather and they just are having a hard time going. If you can uh, grow them during the cool season and providing a decent amount of water or certainly the organic uh, amendmented soil so that the it holds on to the moisture but the roots are able to penetrate the soil just because of all that nice organic matter in there then you will have a very sweet tasting carrot uh, it's kind of like cucumbers during the summer if they don't get the amount of water they really need then the cell structure of the vegetable will concentrate its flavors, which then comes out as bitterness, turpentiny in carrots and bitterness in cucumbers. Cauliflower, of course, is just beautiful. Um, there is a technique where I will fold all of these um, uh, leaves back over the head and I will invert a five gallon nursery container on top of it to exclude the sun and that way if I've purchased like a six pack of, of um, cauliflower I don't want them all coming in within two week period so that will delay the development of them a little bit longer so that I can harvest them more at my choice. Now this one is called 
buttoning because even though the plant is so tiny, it was planted at the same time as the rest of the six pack, but it only developed these little teeny tiny curds like buttons. This is caused just by stress. Um, cauliflower is really prone to stress. So um, this is really something that you want to treat it gingerly, get it transplanted as quickly as you can in coolish weather. In other words, don't do it this weekend. Um, <laughs> you know, wait until the, we're in the low 80s again before you go ahead and purchase these and plant them. Uh, but be aware that if you buy six packs from the nursery, even in another month, chances are they were started from seed now, which means they may bolt on you going to seed automatically, just because they had to deal with this superheat at this time. Here is what is called ricing, and that is literally the head that has then continued to grow out. And it all separates and looks like little grains of rice. Um, and you'll see that it's kind of a, a beigey color as well. That's because it has had so much sun to it instead of being this pure white. Celery is one of the great things that I think all gardeners who are also cooks really needs to grow because you'll recognize the stalk portion down here. Um, and it's probably here that it gets cut off for what we purchase in the store. But when you grow it, it the entire top half of the plant is all this foliage. And that of course is wonderful to use for soups and stews and just making broths um, and all that wonderful stuff. So it's, it's really one of those things that you do have to try at least once. Now, caveat with celery is, as you know from eating it, it's full of water. So it does take um, a considerable amount of irrigation. And um, like I explained with the flavor of the carrots and the cucumbers, if you don't water it enough, it will be pretty hollow and also the flavor will be very strong because it's concentrated, because it's literally um, fewer water, um, the cells are filled with less water and consequently the flavors are accentuated. Chard, of course, wonderful colors now that are staying. When the colors first came out, um, they all turned gray when you cooked them. So it was not one of those things that you wanted to impress your mother-in-law um, by cooking and then having it be this gray mass. Um, but all the colors are very, uh, remain now. And this is the classic one, I think, that just keep harvesting the outer leaves and the young ones will continue on the inside for months and months and months. Uh, I have one charred plant that is the regular uh, white that I'm going on three years now. Um, and collards do the same kind of a thing. Um, and kales, especially the dinosaur kale. And here's a beautiful salmon color that I just love. No difference in flavor, but um, certainly production. Chives, here's the regular uh, little onion chives that are hollow tubes with pink flowers. And this is the garlic chive with a flat leaf that tastes like garlic and the white flowers um, that have little black seeds in them. Um, this garlic chive I did get from um, an Iranian lady who was in our apartment in Davis, uh, she was leaving uh, as we were coming in. And so she explained to me that she uh, had brought this from Iran and I had never seen it before. Um, it is so tenacious 
in the soil and drought tolerant, it just blew me away. It, it literally took a heavy shovel in order to dig around this in order to remove it. So this is definitely one of those things you can plant in an area that doesn't get much water at all and you'll still have a great crop of it. Here we've got um, cilantro that has gone to seed and um, do make a point of uh, thinking that you will have to re-sow your cilantro every maybe three weeks all winter long and into the early summer um, spring because I have found that this just bolts at the merest amount of heat. So I can't count on just having a good patch of it that I keep cutting and growing and cutting and growing. I can maybe get two cuttings out of it and then it decides that it's just too hot. But then if I start another batch of the seed, I'll do fine and be able to have a good amount of cilantro because we do use it a lot. Um, fava beans, here's the beans themselves. Here's the plant that is just so beautiful and the blossoms to it are just so attractive. Fennel, both the smoky fennel and the green fennel. These do put out a lot of seed, but they're also very easy to pull up. So it's not something that I think becomes a problem in the garden. Um, here's garlic. This was one uh, clove of garlic that I had planted next to a rose bush and I had neglected to harvest it. And so the following spring, all these shoots came up. So I dug the whole batch up and split them into their individual shoots and then planted them separately. This is a technique of seeding a small area with several kinds of varieties in this case, these are all different kales. Um, and then being able to take little clumps of each one and transplant them elsewhere in the garden. Um, that way I had one batch, and this is a square of about two foot by two foot, to be able to then um, keep my eye on it, make sure it was watered well, and then be able to take those transplants elsewhere in the garden. Here's a mesclun mix, which of course just means mix um, of all sorts of greens that are great for salads. Um, Renee's Seeds has a couple of collections, one of which is Asian greens for cooking. Another one is the uh, spicy greens for salads and eating raw. So it's nice to be able to have some of those collections available. Here's a batch of kales. Here is the um, dinosaur kale. And I did find that uh, there was one year when I planted, I think, six different kinds of kales just to see which one I liked uh, the growth pattern, which ones I liked the flavor of, at, you know, of course, picking it at several different stages and then which ones lasted through the summer and into the fall and even later than that. And the dinosaur kale was the only one that really kept uh, producing nicely and I really liked the flavor of it and the texture of it. Um, and it ended up making a, a batch of kale trees uh, because the stem just kept growing up and up and up and then I would just harvest the outer leaves so that I always left about four or five leaves in the center, which are the ones that then do the photosynthesis and then go ahead and um, grow the plant more in order for me to then harvest the outer leaves. Here's a big container, a, a horse watering bin that they uh, put some holes in the bottom and had so it's got about a three foot uh, growing depth here which is fine for tomatoes uh, to say nothing of all the more shallow growing uh, veggies. 
Uh, here's a plot of uh, my uh, bed where I've got the lettuces up close to the pathway here, some leeks, uh, some peas going up the trellises, and then at the back I have the cauliflower and the cabbage because this hillside is quite a steep access for me, and so I only want to have to go back there when I'm going to harvest that the cabbage or cauliflower, so it's a one-time kind of deal. We have some kohlrabi. Both the green and the purple, and the uh, flesh of the purple one is the same as the green one. It's just the coloration is just on the outside. And of course, you can eat all of the foliage as well. Leeks, here's a whole row of them that I seeded and I harvest them just as individually as each one gets large enough in order to go ahead and um, use in the garden. Here are some leeks that I had purchased because I had used all of mine and I had to horror of all horrors, I had to spend money for leeks in the market. So I figured I'll get a double whammy out of value here. I cut the leek, um, you know, it had about an inch of roots on it, and that's the way they sell it, which is nice. And then I planted those and got another batch of foliage of that it was all green, there was no another white there, but at least I felt I got a, an additional return on my purchase price. Um, this is a leak that now is starting to bolt. You see the, the head on it here. Now this is when you absolutely have to pick that leak because all of the energy in the plant is going to be sucked up from all of the flesh that you would have eaten into that seed stock and putting out the seeds, the flowers and then the seeds. However, you don't have to throw the whole thing away. You literally cut all the way through and then you pull out the two pieces, the two halves of the stock and put those in the compost pile because those are, um, have already, even though it cuts very much the same as the regular leek, it has really turned into cellulose and um, you can't chew that. We, we don't metabolize that. Um, and I found this out quite by accident because I had harvested my leeks and put them into a stew and then that stew, we were picking out what seemed like pieces of cardboard. So that's how I figured out that this stock is inedible. Um, all of these are lettuces. Um, here's the bed where I had planted them. And you'll notice how close they are. These are the little uh, uh, butter heads, which if you let it mature, it would be maybe six, seven inches across. But what I do is I harvest the outer leaves. I leave only about four of the internal leaves to continue growing. And that way I always have uh, beautiful, tender, little gourmet pieces of lettuce. Now, when each variety starts to bolt is going to be a different timing, as you see from here. I've got four plants uh, in rows that are each of the kinds. So you'll see that these are filling out nicely, but they've not started to bolt. This one hasn't started to bolt, but this one, it's put up its seed stock already. So each plant, e even within each variety, is going to uh, bolt at a different time. So when you are still trying to get some harvest off of a, a whole batch uh, planting area like this, you want to taste one leaf from every single plant before you harvest it. Because you may find that that plant is already gone too bitter for what you like to eat. 
whereas the one next to it is still fine. And the last thing you want is to have a huge salad and find that some pieces are terribly bitter and the other ones, you don't know which piece to eat anymore. And it's all just a big waste. Uh, red mustard is one of those ones that's usually in uh, mescaline mixes. Uh, here's a bok choy that has started to bolt. And I have found that the bok choy is sweeter and the entire stem is much sweeter than when it's the nice little uh, head uh, before it starts to bolt. Here's onion seeds that were in a tire up at the Altadena garden. Uh, parsley that in a whole batch I will just sow the seeds and then each plant as it develops um, as I need a batch of parsley for something I'm preparing, I just grab a handful and I cut it about an inch above the growing point of the soil. And then I work my way through the entire bed. And by the time I get to the end, these first ones that I cut are now having new growth coming up. So it can be a continual harvest. Here's peas, and of course there's many kinds of peas, both the edible pod and the kind you have to shell. A whole different slew of different kinds of radishes. Here's an onion or the leek uh, seed head that it has its cute little hat on it here as it's opening up ready to express its seed. Um, here are speedling trays. Now this is a styrofoam tray. Um, it, it's three inches across at the top and it's three inches down, but it ends up with just one, um, oh, about a quarter of an inch hole at the base so that the, um, the seedling um, root system ends up being like a triangle. When what this enables is that that makes it so much easier to transplant it, um, you know, as opposed to a six pack where you, or even the four inch, where you have to rough up the edges of it in order to put it into the soil. And then you have to hope that the roots know which way to start going out and down to establish themselves in the bed. And with this um, triangular shape, those roots are already oriented to go straight down. And consequently, there is no transplant shot. So these trays are called speedling, S-P-E-E-D-L-I-N-G. And they're available through Peaceful Valley Farm Supply. And the um, uh, web address, it's mail order only. It's up in Nevada City. Um, groworganic.com. And uh, they're quite expensive. I think by now that's maybe 12 bucks or something. And then um, you'll probably want to have the drip tray that fits underneath it perfectly. For years, I searched at the various container stores and Target, trying to find uh, the bin that I could use as the drip tray underneath, and nothing ever fit, so I never purchased it. And then they came out with the trays as well. So, how, so it's a, a pretty penny. It'd be like 12 bucks for this and 12 bucks for the tray. However, I bought mine 40 years ago. So I think they've paid for themselves by now, but it is a considerable layout up front. Okay, this is an example of planting strawberries and lettuces, interplanting them. And that's at this time of year, especially through November. What happens is that the lettuce will uh, start bearing immediately and you'll be starting to harvest those outer leaves. 
the strawberries will just get themselves settled because it's still warm soil, but they then will really be concentrating on developing their root system over the winter and not really starting to do much top growth until maybe February. And that's if it's a hot February. By February, you will have been eating lettuce all winter long, and it'll start being hot enough so that the lettuce will start to bolt. So in the fall and winter, you're getting lettuce, and the strawberry is being pretty slow, establishing itself. In the spring, the lettuce is getting toward the end, but that's when the strawberries will really start taking off. And consequently, you will then get some of your first berries. Um, and another note with strawberries, here's, here's the runners of the strawberries, um, letting them root so then you can transplant them. Um, I always remove the first blossoms in the early spring uh, from my strawberries because I want to wait until the warm weather is absolutely consistent so that before I let those blossoms set, in order that those first berries will be really, really sweet. On the other hand, sometimes you just want that very first berry, so up to you. Uh, spinach, definitely one of the ones to harvest the outer leaves, just like with the lettuce heads. And here's a, a planting bed where I've got the lettuce or the spinach up front, I've got celery in the center, and then the broccoli plants at the back. So that this faces south, so I've got the short guys up front where I'm going to be harvesting um, right by the pathway here, and then maybe once a week getting some of the outer um, stems of the celery, and then walking around to the back here to get the individual broccolis. But consequently, nothing shades each other. They all are in complete sun. And that's it for the veggies. So let's go quickly through um, the flowers. Now, um, will one of you uh, tell me how much time we really have? Do I need to go really quickly through this or? Gina, Sue, what kind of time do I have? Yvonne, this is Danielle. We have about 10 minutes. Okay. Um, we, if you would like to take questions after and if people wanna stay around um, after 11 o'clock, We've got about 10 minutes for the rest of the slotted time. Um, we might find people dropping off after that. Sure. Uh, about how much time we've got for the meeting. Okay, okay good. Um, all right. In this case, I would urge you to go uh, get that, uh, well, at a later time, the list itself. Or if you need to, just email me and I will send you the list. Um, so this Achillea here, the yarrow, um, these are all the Astromeria, or many Astromeria colors, and you'll see it makes a nice um, hill of it. Um, this is the main pathway up through my garden. There is one, the Astromeria that is called the florist kind is only about 10, 12 inches tall, whereas most of these that I have, they get up to three, four feet tall but they just bloom forever. So it, and it varies. Each of the colors blooms at a different time. That's a wonderful thing to plant. Alyssum, um, amaranthus, these little beige speckles are the seeds. I'm not sure if you can eat all of the seed of amaranthus or if there's a particular variety that is the one that's more nutritious. Here we've got the, um, Amaryllis, uh, the arbutus here, here's the arum lily. I always wish that this one 
bloomed at Halloween with that great purple. Um, here we've got the Asclepias uh, butterfly weed, but I understand from the California Native Plant Society that you want to uh, plant the native versions, not these colorful ones. You know, the orange one is mostly sold and um, sometimes the yellow. I haven't seen the pinks very frequently. Here's Bachelor Button is a grape by seed. Bull Bean is a, I've never seen it commercially, but I just so love it. It's a succulent that just doesn't take any water and it just continues on forever. Um, when we get to the point where we can actually meet in person again, I can bring tons of this to share with everyone. Um, calendula, camellias, cannas. This is chasmanth. Um, it comes both in the yellow and the orange. It's a bulb um, and it's wonderful because it's a January, February kind of thing. A uh, wonderful color when nothing else is. The coneflower, uh, this is the crinum. Um, it makes quite a huge, this is about a six foot tall and wide. Um, and this is the blossom stalk. However, the foliage gets really ratty after a while. So it kind of, if you're somebody who wants a, a neat garden, you don't want to grow that. Um, the crocus, here's the um, official crocus that makes the saffron. This was taken uh, in England when we visited one of those castles. The cyclamen, daffodils. This is a tree dahlia. This is about 10 feet tall, and each of the flowers is about six or seven inches wide. Daylilies, shastas, um, up at the um, Luther Burbank Home and Museum up in Santa Rosa, they have beds with about 10 of these different kinds of daisies that is what Burbank crossed in order to create what we call the Shasta daisy. This is Dianella. It makes the cutest little flower that looks like a mini um, sweet pea. And then the, the berries on it are this bluish purple. It's just extraordinary. Dutch iris, Echium, um, Epiphyllum, Euphorbias. Now this tree euphorbia, it, it branches after every year. So this is one, two, three, four. This is probably the fifth year. Uh, more of the euphorbias, different colors. The Fortnite lily with the inset here of the blossom that has both the yellow and the purple. Um, Fever few here, and all these freesias. Now, if you can get a hold of this freesia, this is the species freesia. It's just a um, creamy color with a little bit of yellow in the center, but this is the one that all the other ones are bred from, and the fragrance on this is just amazing. Okay, the California fuchsia, um, Gallardias, um, Gaura. These uh, sway in the breeze. It looks like little pink butterflies flitting around. Uh, goldenrod, and you know, of course, that this is not the problem with people who have <coughs> allergies. But it grows at the, it blossoms at the same time that ragweed does, and ragweed is the problem. This is Hardenbergia. It makes a beautiful um, a vine. Uh, I have mine just growing in this mound, and these are the teeny tiny little purple with a wee bitty little green, lime green in the center that sets it off. Hollyhocks. 
bearded iris, Irish bells, um, plant that the blossoms are green, but of course it's really this little white thing that is actually the flower part. The calyx around is the green one. Um, Irisini, Justicia, lion's tail or lion's mane, and I prefer this one that is super orange, but many of them are um, literally more beigey. So um, you do want to purchase this when it's already blossoming so that you can see the actual color. This is Larkspur by Seed. Peruvian Lily is just this super delicate little one. Um, Mesperia Iris, Limonium or Status, Lavender, Melianthus, this is about six foot tall. It's beautiful foliage, um, but the blossom, this is about a three foot long thing on it that is um, a maroon color and it's just exquisite. This is Mesambrianthium. I don't know what the current botanic name is, but that's the one I grew up calling it. And it's an early spring. Um, April is generally the time that its color comes out. Paper whites, of course they're yellow. Um, mums, all the different kinds of colors that are coming out now. More of the nasturtiums. This is Ferraria crispa, which is just the strangest little blossom, but you see there's a ton of them on there. It also is a bulb. And that's something I dig up every year and hand out at our um, Southern California Horticulture Society meetings. Um, it has been at the um, Friendship Hall over by Los Feliz exit off of the five freeway. Uh, but of course we've been online since then, but I always bring lots of my plants um, to those meetings once we start meetings again. Here's Nigella. This is Nicotiana sylvestris. This is one uh, that uh, Thomas Jefferson grew. And the Pelargonium penstemon poppies. This is not, this is my photograph, but it's not my garden. All of these are from my garden except this one. This was out at the antelope valley. Uh, poppies, here's all the bread seed poppies, and this is when you want to save the seed. You have to, and this is the case with anything, with lettuce um, and this as well, it's going to take at least a month after the last harvest that you make, like of the lettuce, in order to have it be as dry as possible. You have to let this get till it's absolutely crispy dry. See down here, you can still see a bit of green in the stem, but up here, if you can snap this off, then it's ready. If it wiggles around a bit, don't pick it because it's not fully uh, dry or mature. And consequently, you not only will perchance have that spoil, in your saving seed, but it's, it's gonna ruin the rest of the batch. Now in the poppies here, you notice that it's like a little salt shaker at the very top here. So I make a point of putting a um, dishwashing basket. I hold it over this and then I pull the head down into that so that when it scatters, it's all in the bucket rather than, um, because you can't cut it off without having them snap out of that. Okay, ranunculus, Rudbeckia, salvia. This is salvia canariensis. Uh, it has a beautiful blue-green top and all the stem on there is all like a cotton wrapped around it. Here's another salvia, I think this is Costa Rica. And this is Lutea, Salvia Lutea, 
which is a brown flower. So of course that was too weird, so I had to have it. This is a Peruvian um, lily, it's a scylla. The snapdragon, the stock, this is also the species stock. It has a tremendous fragrance to it, but it's just a little single flower and it does scatter all, all over, but it's so easy just to pull up. It doesn't really hang in there. And bunch of sunflowers, succulents, sweet peas, tithonia, which is Mexican sunflower. This now, uh, you can buy it as a compact little plant. Uh, when I was first growing it, it was a six foot kind of thing. Veronica and Watsonia, which is another bulb, uh, very much like the chasmanth, but it's this uh, wonderful dark pink. And that's it. Yvonne. Thank you. Okay. Um, boy, this has been a great presentation. Uh, we do have some wonderful questions people came up with. Great. So anyone who wants to hang on to the, uh, the very end of the presentation and hear these questions and their answers, you are welcome to stay. Now I just need to find my list of questions. Aha, here we go. Okay, um, the questions were accumulating all the way through the presentation, so they go back to different things you've covered. Danica Pogue, I don't know if I'm saying your name right, Danica. Thank you. Can asparagus grow only in containers or, I'm, I'm sorry, can asparagus also grow in containers or only in the ground? Yes, it can be in the container just like that artichoke was but just make sure that it's a really deep container, you know, as well as wide, because the roots are going to develop further out. So at some point it's going to fill the container. Um, and they also can last 15, 20 years if they're happy. Um, but, you know, definitely I wouldn't go with less than like two foot deep. Cool. Do they also put out runners? Well, the, it, the root looks kind of like a hand. You know, this, this is where the, the asparagus comes up. And so it's kind of like a, a, the astromeria is the same thing. What it does, and the, like, if you picture the bearded iris, it'll kind of keep crawling in that direction. So that's why it will expand that entire root zone. Cool. Now the, we will have the new new ones coming up. Cool. So it just gets bigger and bigger. Right. Okay. Does asparagus need... Let, let me add one thing to yeah. both asparagus and artichoke. They're very heavy feeders, which mm -hmm. means you should always plan on giving them like a two inch deep uh, batch of manure every year. Wow. Because they will need to come up. So, you know, the organic... <coughs> Excuse me, the organic matter will kind of break down, so then you just put another layer on top as mulch. You don't want to be cultivating it in because you'll damage the actual root. Okay, do you, need a, do you need a sip of water or something? Okay. I love your earrings, by the way. Yeah. Um. <laughs> oh, you know, you know what? What? These are uh, cantaloupe melon seeds. Oh my God. That are dyed. And the center is millet. And so she just put it on, you know, to this plaque. So you can create your own. That is brilliant. Now, still on asparagus, the initial long growth, do you need to trim that back or should you just let it die off on its own? Uh, asparagus, uh, definitely. Same thing with artichoke. Let it die back on its own because that's absorbing all that energy back into those roots. 
Yeah. That's what makes the distinguishing between annuals and perennials. The perennial, it just brings all that energy back down into the roots, and that's where the energy will come from for the next year's crop. Whereas annuals are just dying completely. Cool. Rina Kazo, and again, forgive me if I'm saying your name wrong, Rina. Is kale like shard and will continue to grow all year, year after year? Yes and no. It depends on the variety and your care in the garden. If you recall when I said that I grew five kinds of kale that one year, just to see which I liked, but also which one was going to keep growing. And so it was the dinosaur kale was the only one that kept growing past that uh, that fall. So you'll just have to see in your garden, you know, um, I always make um, the error perhaps of um, less water and more development of the soil. Um, and consequently, if you give it more water, it may do fine in your space. But I make a point of trying to see how little water I can give all of my plants and still have them produce enough so that I'm happy with having spent the effort on them. Excellent. Okay, JC asks, for carrots, is it better to wait for cooler weather to plant, or is this weekend fine? You could do some now, um, and then, you know, every other week do some more, because um, peas are the same way. I found last year that I started putting in my peas and then nothing seemed to come up. So two weeks later, I'd replant that area. And for the third time, I'd plant them in. And then, of course, they all came up. <laughs> so, so, you know, it's like, well, I'm giving you the chance, you know, when are you going to finally germinate? Um, so keep trying and then, um, you know, preferably in another little space in the garden so that any that do germinate are going to be able to have space to develop. And then they may go all at once. Now carrots and parsley are notorious for taking three weeks to germinate. So what is good is to interplant them or intersow radishes because radishes will come up within a couple days. And especially if you have clay soil, what happens is that the carrot seeds is not strong enough to bust through a bit of the um, crust on the clay soil that you kept watering, you know, and so, and it form when it dries, it kind of locks everybody in the particles together and the carrot can't bust through. But the radish does, and because the radish is gradually growing, it kind of keeps all that soil surface in movement enough so that the carrots can come up through it. So that's a good, good plan. And then temperature-wise and moisture-wise, that's why I'm saying, you know, do it every, say, second or third week, but recognize that, you know, the first week you'll water it, the second week you'll maybe kind of forget a couple days, and then by the third week you'll give up, and then they'll all come up. So, <laughs> they like to tease you. And just knowing that that's, that's what Karen is playing at. So, <laughs> to, uh, take advantage of that, you know, knowing that it's not you, it's the carrot. Okay. Inika Castaneda uh, wants to know where she can find iceberg lettuce seeds. Just check with all of the, the different nursery outlets that you have and um, online. I don't know specifically um, most, you know, like Burpee, and I don't know whether Renee's um, does or Seeds of Change and um, on my website, 
I think on the web links page on the extreme right hand side down is a whole list of my favorite catalogs. So you might check there um, and then check with those particular catalogs because I think most of them will carry at least one or two kinds of of icebergs because I always prefer the butter crunch um, type, the butter head. So I'm I don't have um, iceberg in in my head, but certainly those catalogs um, and then the big regular ones like burpees should have it because they're more national. Terrific. Okay, Anthony Middle says every winter my tail gets torn up by pets. Any tips? And we've also let me go over some other related questions. We have, we have, uh, Danica says tail is being devoured by cabbage worms. Has anyone had? No, I, I can't understand what you're saying. Okay. Um, Danica says that kale is being devoured, her tail is being devoured by cabbage worms. Did you get that? Um, uh, her kale is got pests, is that what you said? Cabbage worms, specifically. Oh. And she wants to know if anyone has had success with parasitic wasp eggs. And then another person says, same issue with breast. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, but let me, um, there is a, a, the integrated pest management website from the university is a wonderful resource. Um, and I'm, I always get it wrong. So let me, um, okay. Okay. <clears throat> IPM dot UC a n r dot e d u it's integrated pest management university of california agriculture and natural resources and then e d u now there is something on there that is called pest notes you'll see that the first thing that comes up is the home, garden, turf, and landscape, which is generally, that's where you'll go to start looking up individual plants. But on the left-hand uh, bar, it has pest notes. And that is where it has, uh, you know, whole lists of things like, what was it, the, the cabbage, that'll be on there. So you can look at things through the, the uh, listing of the vegetable or the plant or the pest. So it makes it a, a really easy to find some great information and it will give you the entire, um, you know, a huge range of um, uh, possible approaches from what we used to call little guns, you know, like just digging up a weed to big guns with, uh, you know, Roundup and the whole thing. So there's, there's all these choices that they give you after describing what the, what this plant or the pest is all about and how it, um, what its preferred environment is so that you can change yours so it doesn't match. So that'll, that's a great resource just for people, you get lost in there. I mean, it's a monstrous <laughs> website, but there's just so much information. Okay, so the, uh, that website is in the uh, chat feed right now. Great. Okay, so a uh, next question is, uh, Chella says, I removed strawberry blossoms last spring and subsequent flowers all shriveled despite copious, copious watering. Did you get that? She, re she removed the blossoms and then what? And then any flowers, she, she removed the first blossoms and the blossoms that came after that all shriveled, even though she gave them a lot of water. 
maybe it was too much water. You know, that's one of the puzzling things that um, if a plant has too much water or not enough water, it, it droops either way. So you can't, you know, it's like, well, which extreme did we do? Um, because if they just shriveled, that means it could, it could be either too much or not enough water. Um, you know, sometimes they're, like if you're not really paying attention to the, um, the weather forecast, and, or it feels comfortable to you, but you don't realize that it's been 10 degrees hotter every day for a week, well, of course, those plants are still going on the water regimen that you had done or not done. And now the weather has been so tremendously different that it is going to droop back. And if you don't really realize what has happened, then you're kind of wondering why the plant is having a problem. Um, so it's really important to, um, to pay attention to the weather and know that if it's going to be like five degrees hotter over the next several days, then maybe you should go ahead and water. Um, but it makes it really difficult because some people, you know, they're always out there watering or every day after work, if they go to work, um, they're watering the thing, whereas that's only going to keep the top moisture in the soil maybe an inch or two deep and there's not gonna be anything further down. So there's a real danger to frequent shallow watering because the roots aren't gonna be able to grow down into where it's really moist. Um, and consequently, the, the deep infrequent watering, like I will, and, and the difficulty, of course, is that each of us has a different soil context that we're dealing with. So you kind of just have to, another thing I uh, recommend is to buy a soil moisture meter. You know, it's at Home Depot. It's, it's got a prong on it about, well, the size of your hand. And so instead of guessing whether or not my fruit trees had been watered sufficiently or needed water, I put this in like four different places around the tree and I'll see, well, gee, it's dry over there, but it's wet on this side. So that way you get an absolute reading on what's going on under your soil. And so for vegetable beds, it would be the same thing. Um, and for strawberries you know, as well. Just see, okay, now I see that the water made it down this deep and that was after 10 minutes or that was after an hour. So then you can adjust your watering according to what the soil is really enabling the water to move or not move. Beautiful. Um, boy, I am learning so much today. I really love this. <laughs> Uh, we have just a few more questions that are pretty much all about flowers. Uh, we want to know, Danica wants to know which flowers are more drought tolerant? Well, most of those, because that's one reason I chose them to be planted now, because a lot of them are perennials or like that bull bean, you, you plant it now you water it in once just to literally melt the soil around the roots and that's it you never have to water again wow. whether or not it rains wow so um you know and the a lot of those bulbs and everything it's it's just absolutely that's all of those plants okay now on that list that you provided uh are these all for blooming in the spring or will some of them bloom in the winter? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, is there anywhere that anyone could get a list of which are winter blooms and which are spring blooms? Um, Do you have that on your website somewhere? 
these are all spring, but some of them like the, um, uh, Uh, the Fortnite lily will be during the, some of them will be very early spring, like the irises, uh, but then some of them will be later in the spring or the early summer. Um, and some of them will extend for months, like the lion's mane and the salvias. That'll be going the whole spring into uh, fall. Now, something like the paper white, that will bloom in December, won't it? The what? Paper whites? That's super early spring. Oh, okay. Um, our sunflowers, is it truly now the time to plant sunflowers? Yeah, you know, um, when we first started collecting seed packets from various companies, in order to provide to the master gardeners to take to the community gardens. Um, we made uh, bins and we used an empty seed packet as the title up front. Mm -hmm. And consequently, I had a bag of seeds that I brought home and I just scattered on the entire garden. And those sunflowers came up in January. So it was like they're, and progressively, as those have re sown themselves, there's always some sunflowers coming up, just like the amaranth. There's always some coming up, and it's like every time I will water, I'll get another batch of those amaranthus coming up again. So wow. a lot of them are self sowing, just apparently they have a very broad range of temperature that is going to be successful for them to germinate and it's just a matter of giving them some water. Cool. Victor wants to know which of these flowers are edible? The flowers. We know nasturtiums are edible, both the flowers and... Okay, your, your best bet on that is going online and looking, you know, just googling edible flowers um, because I know for one thing the daylilies um, what's her name there's a woman who has put out several books on edible flowers I think she was one of the first ones maybe 30 years ago and she described the um, daylilies that she had that she said that, um, it, and the same thing with uh, marigolds, um, that some of them, uh, how did she put it? They're all edible, certain parts of the plant, like the roots are not edible, the, the little stamens and the pistil are not edible, but the petals are. So it's what part of the plant that is edible. And number two, it may be edible, but it may taste terrible. <laughs> so that's, that's why it's important. And also, I mean, we're dealing with potential um, uh, poisonous situation. So that's why it's important to go to some of those real, um, uh, um, you know, the resources that are going to have specific varieties are the ones that you want to be able to consider. So daylily is edible, sometimes some parts, some varieties. So your best advice is to do your homework before you eat any of them. Absolutely. Okay, we have one, we have one last question to bring this presentation home with. Um, where did it go? Okay, Bruno would like to know, how do you water your plants and do, what kind of a system do you use or do you? Um, <clears throat> my dad put in, he, he arranged all the fruit trees. 
and he put in one line that went up and had a sprinkler at the top that then would cascade the water to the outside of the, um, you know, the canopy of the tree, so that it was like rain. And he would turn it on at night, and the next morning he would turn it off. So it had maybe 12 hours of irrigation, of rain. I can't do that. <laughs> you know, the money is just beyond what I could manage to do that. So I use his system once a month for an hour on each tree, literally to wash the leaves so that the tree can accomplish its photosynthesis much more easily. And this is especially during the summer, you know, when there's dust blowing and everything else. So it's literally a cosmetic and just cleaning the, the leaf, so to speak. Besides that, what I have as I've uh, grown new or planted new trees is that I will um, plant it at the center of a basin um, and from the trunk to the edge, the radius, will be about three feet. So this will be a six foot wide basin, you know, with a, I just pile the dirt around the edge and then that's what I fill with water and I'll put the hose in there and just let it soak, make a little lake and then have that sink in. And I, with the length of time I've found, it, you know, turning the, the faucet on full bore, that way I'll see, well, this is how the next day I will use my moisture meter and I'll see how far down the water went. So if it's a foot or if it's two feet with an hour's watering, you know, then I will adjust the amount of time that I'm using for it. Now in a vegetable bed, I do somewhat the same thing. Um, however, I also plant the f uh, five gallon nursery buckets that have the holes at the bottom. Like if you buy a, a, an ornamental or you buy a, a fruit tree, it's got the the, it's the five gallon container that has the holes on the bottom. And I plant that up to the rim or like three inches above the rim is sticking out. And I put my hose into there and the water comes out the bottom. And on my website, I have quite a few areas um, under blog. On the right hand side is a search bar. So if you put in watering or irrigation or nursery buckets or something, it'll bring up all the blogs that I wrote about the technique. Wow. So I'm watering from the top, but I'm also watering so that that bucket is releasing the water a good foot down in the soil. And consequently the roots are started up top because I've seeded it or I've transplanted my seedlings. So the water is there, but then it's reaching down to the bottom of that bucket where the water is coming out. So that the roots are always going to be six inches to a foot deep. And consequently, when it gets hot like this 110, I fill the bucket up once a week and that's it. It's doing fine. Oh my God, that's so easy. Exactly. The right. one problem I did find was that when I put the, when I uh, sunk the bucket all the way to the surface, I ended up getting a lot of lizards that <laughs> fell in. Oh. So the next time I'd water, they'd be going like this. You know, <laughs> I'd have to fish them out. So now I, I put the bucket up and there's still a couple lizards that will crawl up and over. But so every time I put the, the water faucet into the, 
I mean, the wand into the bucket, I have to make sure that nobody's <laughs> spent water in there. <laughs> now, the other thing that you can do with that technique is put in a shovel full of compost or a shovel full of manure so that when it fills with water, it's automatically letting out compost tea or manure tea into the soil base. And that's where those roots are uh, growing down to. And consequently, they're being fed every time you water without your having to do it. Wow. Thank you so much, Yvonne. I think yeah. we all really, really are going to walk away with a lot of new knowledge today. Um, well, let, let me add that um, I always am so aware that there's, there's so much coming out and you're trying to absorb it. When, not if, when you get to the point where you're kind of wondering, what did she say? Just email me and I'll, I'll go through it again. <laughs> okay, well, we're going to make sure that everybody has your email. We also are going to have this video on our YouTube channel, which there should be a link or there will be a link provided when we collect up all the resources for this. Right, session. and do um, send that to me so then I can post it on there and that way people will have that as an access as well. So okay. make sure that you're giving them my uh, gardening in LA at gmail.com. Okay, Danielle will take care of that because she is very thorough. Um, it's been great having you here. In addition to you and the wonderful uh, UCCE Master's Program, Master Gardener's Program that you left behind that is still operating, anybody who is interested in getting certified as a Master Gardener should definitely check that out. Uh, and in, um, in November, I think it's usually about the 1st of November, they send out the flyer about it and I will send that to my mailing list. So if you're on my mailing list, you will automatically get that. But you can also just Google Master Gardener Program and then it usually comes up with the entire state. So then you click on Los Angeles and it'll give you the website. And just so people know, the program started by Yvonne uh, there are Master Gardener programs all across the country. Hers, right. in particular, focuses on food gardens and uh, repercussions throughout the greater Los Angeles area have been enormous in terms of setting up food gardens in areas that were considered uh, food deserts, yeah. where people don't have access to, you know, healthy organic produce. They're now growing them in parkways, medians, front yards, church yards, all over the place. Um, you have changed the face of Los Angeles food gardening, and I truly well, love you for this. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just been absolutely wonderful, you know, to enable people to stop being scared of killing plants, you know. <laughs> When, when um, Master Gardeners marvel at how much I babble on about some plants, I have to remind them that I killed more plants than they ever knew existed, okay? And that's how you learn stuff. Well, I did it that way and it didn't work. Now, this might have been the reasons for it, so let's do it a different way. And All sometimes, experiments, you know? Yeah, always experimenting. You know, there's a, there was a great line in a Dustin Hoffman movie, Little Big Man. It was when Chief Dan George decided that he his time had come and he was going to die. So they put him up on the, the rack the way it was typical for that tribe. And Dustin came back like a month later and Chief Dan George was just back doing his regular activities. And Dustin Hoffman asked him, well, what happened? I thought you were going to, you know, meet the great spirit. And Chief Dan George said, sometimes the magic works and sometimes it doesn't. It's the same thing with gardening. 
<laughs> thank you again, Yvonne. I would also like to thank and acknowledge the original Seed Library of Los Angeles out of Venice, California, of which we are a branch, no pun intended, and the, <laughs> Al <laughs> the Altadena Library, which has been our sponsor Absolutely. for the last, I can't keep track, three years, four years, whenever it is that our founder for the branch, Jessica Yarger, started us up. We have been hosted up until the COVID situation at the library itself, and hopefully someday we will get back to our wonderful meeting room over there. But meanwhile, Zoom is our salvation. Right. We only get to talk about plants instead of share them. <laughs> I know, but it's better than, you know, it's a sharp stick in the eye. What can I say? Um, thank you all for coming, um, and please come back next month for a new presentation that I just realized I don't know what it is. I think it might be plant propagation, but I could be wrong. But uh, we will be promoting it on social media channels, particularly Instagram. And uh, any of you who are on Instagram, please follow us there at uh, Slola Altadena. Um, thank you again. And if there is no further business, I will end the session. Thank you.